currently visiting lecturer of Chinese studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Benjamin Ridgway was a former student of mine at the U of M. In fact, he was one of my last students who completed the PhD degree in Chinese literature under my direction. Ben wrote his dissertation on the Ci or song lyrics of Su Shi, who was one of the greatest figures in song literature and culture. And Su Shi actually rolled a few roles into one. He was a statesman, a prose writer, a poet, a songwriter, uh, a musician, evidently, a calligrapher, and a philosopher as well. Quite a remarkable uh, man in his own history. And Ben wrote a dissertation on one aspect of the Su Shi, uh, the song lyrics. Ben is now revising that dissertation into a book manuscript for publication. Since completing his PhD degree, Ben has taught uh, Chinese language and literature at Middlebury College and the Parezo University. Since leaving Michigan, Ben has also expanded his research interests from the narrow domain of late Northern Song, uh, Ci poetry, to other broader areas of Northern and Southern Song culture. His lecture today, titled Two Halls of Hangzhou, the shifting geopolitical significance of a Song Dynasty city is seen through three local gazetteers, represents one sample of achievements of his new research. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Benjamin Ridgway. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, uh, introduction, uh, Professor Lin. It's, it's a pleasure to be back at my alma mater and to see you, uh, to see other friends, uh, colleagues uh, from the University of Michigan. It's such a dynamic Asian studies community here, and it's uh, double the pleasure of some of the experts, uh, uh, scholars of the Song Dynasty, the area I work on in particular. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Joseph Lam, uh, Professor of uh, Music, <coughs> and also, of course, Director of the Confucius Institute here at the University of Michigan. And also a big thank you to the staff of CIUM uh, for helping me get here uh, smoothly uh, uh, and all of the uh, help in arranging the accommodations, logistics, uh, great care uh, and effort that went into that. So thank you very much. Uh, as Professor Lin mentioned, uh, my, my earlier research focused on uh, sort of one particular genre, uh, song lyrics, and one particular writer, Su Shi, <coughs> the themes of exile and travel. Uh, but now I'm sort of trying to look uh, more broadly at uh, intersections between literature and geography. And today what I'm going to talk about is uh, the city of Hangzhou, Hangzhou a major city uh, in uh, southeast of China, uh, very near to modern day Shanghai. Uh, you may know it for its famous West Lake, okay, it's a natural beauty, uh, it's a ma major uh, tourist site now. Um, but the historical context that I'm looking in at today, kind of the background of it, is a uh, period in Chinese history, the Southern Song, uh, when uh, the northern sort of half of the Chinese Empire had been uh, invaded by non-Han Chinese uh, uh, people, the Jurchen. Uh, essentially, uh, everything north of the Huai River uh, had become uh, occupied territory. So, uh, you know, sort of imagine the United States, everything north of the Mason-Dixon line uh, having been occupied by an invading power. Uh, that's kind of the context in which we're we're taking a look. Hangzhou was chosen as the capital of the Southern Song. And traditionally, capitals had usually been on the, uh, you know, within the uh, Yellow River Plain in the north. Uh, so this was something of a, a, a controversial decision well into the 12th and 13th century, as I'll, I'll try to show. And so some of this, uh, a large amount of this talk is going to be about uh, how uh, that decision has come about, sort of some of the tensions it's raised. And more broadly, I'm interested in the future of looking at how the decision to make Hangzhou the southern zone capital shifted different kind of 
regional geographic relationships. Just imagine when Philip, you know, in U.S. history, when when the capital shifted from Philadelphia to Washington D.C., uh, that that kind of changed the dynamic, interregional dynamics in the United States as well. It was chosen for certain specific reasons. So let me kind of launch into my launch into my thesis. Uh, the materials I'm going to be using. Uh, there's a handy handout. Yes, a very convenient handout. Uh, located at the back of the room. I'm going to be kind of walking us through some key texts uh, in two local gazetteers. I'm looking at two local gazetteers on Hangzhou uh, called Lin An, uh, the temporary peace. Uh, it was always thought this was a, was, a, was a temporary situation. It turned out to be long term. But there's a handout of some of the texts that I'll be walking through. Am, am, am I loud enough? Can everyone hear me? I know I'm, I, I prefer to stand. <laughs> uh, so if, if, if my teaching voice is is sufficiently loud, then I will, I will proceed as 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 is. If not, I can I can pick up the hand mic and and uh, <coughs> amplify my voice. Okay, so um, the title of the talk I've shifted a little bit, uh, but it's still two halls of Hangzhou, local gazetteers, and the grading of geography for a Song Dynasty city. Um, my talk today, I'm going to trace the shifting geopolitical significance of Hangzhou as presented in two local gazetteers, I'll talk about that in a second, dating from the Southern Song Dynasty, 1127 to 1276. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on literary works quoted in both of these gazetteers that describe two of Hangzhou's famous halls on West Lake. Uh, so, uh, uh, and those are the Hall of Possessing Beauty and the Hall of Centrality and Peace. In the writings on these halls, in both gazetteers, we see a common contrast between two presentations of Hangzhou's geopolitical significance as understood by literati elite of the Southern Song. So two different halls. These two gazetteers, I'm saying, have a consistent approach to them, but the two halls represent sort of two views of the city in, in the uh, Southern Song. In writings concerning the hall possessing beauty, Hangzhou was viewed as a city of rising economic and cultural importance during the Northern Song, the 11th century. Writings on the Hall of Centrality and Peace, in contrast, depict Hangzhou as an imperial refuge for a court in flight and associated with a motif of territorial loss during the Southern Song when, as I mentioned just a while ago, the city became the dynastic capital. Um, as I uh, proceed through the, these uh, examples, um, I'll try to show, uh, conclude that the gazetteers, uh, this is also kind of a reflection of what gazetteers were, what they did, function to grade and rank different, <coughs> excuse me, different kinds of landscapes in order to make geopolitical arguments, meaning they weren't neutral. Uh, they were uh, uh, grading and ranking different kinds of landscapes in order to make geopolitical arguments about the proper reconstitution of the empire as a whole. So the, the North was lost. Uh, how should that be remedied? So um, here, uh, before we uh, go into this, I want to kind of give a, a little um, introduction to what are local gazetteers? <clears throat> um, and these can be contrasted with another important type of geographical writing that preceded local gazetteers. So in the Northern Song, uh, the, sort of the most important form of geographic writing were known as map guides, or tu jing, tu jing. Um, These were map guides. Okay. Um, I'll come back to the second one. Uh, map guides <clears throat> were uh, produced by local officials, and they were submitted to the Northern Song Central Government Bureau of Operations by every prefect of every uh, prefecture on a regular basis, maybe every three years. This started in 1002, the year 1002. They included information on local products, customs, and territorial organization of their jurisdiction, and they enabled the Northern Song government to maintain an effective monopoly on spatial knowledge, uh, and to carry out the division of the empire into prefectures and other administrative units. So they were very much, uh, they were objective geographic facts. They were about uh, breaking the empire into jurisdictions and managing them over the long run. How about local gazetteers? <clears throat> local gazetteers do not really begin to appear until the Southern Song. That is until you know half the empire has been lost, uh, until the capital is relocated to Hangzhou. And they're significantly different from Jing, uh, from map guides. So what are local gazetteers like? Well, the Southern Song government ceased to collect geographic information after the collapse of the Northern Song. It sort of ceded that uh, administrative role, uh, no longer collected that information from any prefect at any time. Um, private scholars kind of filled the vacuum, and they began to compile local gazetteers. 
uh, often with the cooperation and sponsorship of local officials. So it's kind of a private-public uh, joint venture, as you might say. Scholars and officials working together to produce these uh, monographs on certain places, like Pop Joe. Uh, Ruth Mo Moster, an important scholar at UC, UC Merced, a uh, geographer by, by discipline, um, I have great respect for her work, uh, said that here's how they're different from um, map guides. Local gazetteers were moral and didactic. Geographies supported by vast apparatuses of bibliographies and illusions that went beyond the reach of administrative functions. So they have lots of literary illusions to sort of create a sense of place. Uh, those didn't really exist in map guides to any great extent. <clears throat> uh, they feature idiosyncratic local and literary content. Okay, so again, they're not really neutral. <laughs> uh, they would have been useless to the Bureau of Operations compilers. They weren't so good for you know, creating new maps of regions per se, but uh, they did give a very deep sense of place with literary text. Uh, James Hargett, another uh, scholar of uh, Chinese literature and a really great translator, <clears throat> has suggested that local gazetteers can be thought of as scholarly monographs. Okay, so kind of going from a purely administrative tool uh, to something more like a scholarly monograph uh, that has moral and didactic interests embedded within it. So which gazetteers am I looking at? Well, uh, we're really lucky um, <coughs> to have three, uh -huh, uh, three gazetteers just for the city of Hangzhou, known then as Lin'an, and I'm just looking at the first two in this talk. So I'd be happy to talk about the third one if you like, but um, really in this talk just focus on two. They are called <coughs> uh, the uh, Qiandao Lin'an Zhi, the Qiandao Lin'an Gazetteer. Qiandao is a reign title. Mm -hmm. Lin'an is the city, Zhi is the genre, uh, the gazetteer. Uh, compiled in 1167, <coughs> the head compiler was named Zhou Zong. Uh, the other one is the uh, Chunyo Lin'an Zhi, uh, or the Chunyo Lin'an Gazetteer. Again, Chunyo is a reign title. Uh, compiled by Zhao Yu Chou. <coughs> Um, there were a couple of important challenges about writing about Hangzhou in a gazetteer. Uh, one uh, is that there were, in some ways, still at least still two capitals that existed at that time. Uh, the lost capital in the north, called Bianliang or Bianjing, um, was still in in political discourse referred to as the capital, even though it was occupied. Uh, technically, it was still the capital. That is in modern day Kaifeng. Haifeng and Henan province. Then there's also Lin'an, the temporary peace, which is sort of, in theory, the temporary capital, but it ends up being the permanent one. Um, so it was very touchy in a way, uh, very kind of sensitive to try to write about Lin'an uh, as the capital. <coughs> uh, another challenge just for modern scholars looking at this material is it's rather fragmented, and I think it's important to point this out. Uh, in the first one, so I'm just going to abbreviate for simplicity, QLZ, <laughs> in the QLZ, there are only three of an original 15 uh, uh, Juan uh, extant. Okay, so these are kind of like the chapters. There's really only three of 15 of these left. Uh, the, the loss in the second case um, is even greater. Uh, eight of the original 52 are still extant. So we have to kind of use these sources um, carefully, uh, but I think, uh, as I'll show in a minute, they, there are certain chapters that are complete in both versions, and those are the ones that I'm going to compare. So we do have to acknowledge the loss of a lot of material, but still there, are, there is a substantial basis for comparison. Um, and I'm going to focus largely on the second one, and we have a little information about uh, the second editor, uh, Zhao Yuchou, uh, and sort of his motivation for uh, compiling this gazetteer. Uh, he was, his, his, his last name is Zhao, Zhao, and those, for those of you who studied the Song Dynasty, you may know that Zhao is the royal family. <clears throat> uh, it is the royal family. He was a 10th uh, generation descendant of the Song Dynasty founder, so he was a member of the royal family. Um, we have a very brief preface for CLZ, okay, the second of the gazetteers, written by uh, someone on his editorial staff named Chen Ren Yu, uh, who uh, was born in 1212, we don't know when he died. Um, and he kind of conveys um, Zhao Yuto's motivation for um, uh, editing this, this gazetteer. And he states, concerned about the loss of maps and documents, in his heart he deeply loathed the state of affairs and feared that this was not the way by which to honor the imperial abode, nor the way to propagate filial respect. He was alarmed to the point that he could not rest. 
Um, so think of this in the context of the central government has abandoned collecting uh, uh, maps and this type of geographical information, uh, take into account that he was a member of the royal clan, uh, so there's this uh, sense of filial, filial piety there uh, um, that he's uh, motivated. He had the QLZ, he thought it was insufficient. It was shorter by far, even its complete state. He wants to fill it out, uh, make it complete, and probably insert some of his own ideas about um, <clears throat> how the empire should be reconstituted. So I'm going to talk about these two halls. Uh, the Hall of Possessing Beauty, mm -hmm, that was largely uh, extant just in the northern zone, uh, and this Hall of Centrality and Peace. And just to kind of give you a sense of where these are, uh, if you've ever been to Hangzhou, has anyone been to Hangzhou before? Oh, wow, OK. <laughs> so we're talking to people who know their Hangzhou. All right, then. Um, here is the famous West Lake. <clears throat> and uh, these two halls are both located on mountains in this region. Uh, so in just a second, uh, the Hall of uh, Possessing Beauty, uh, Youmei Tang, is uh, on top of Wu Shan, Wu Shan. And the uh, Hall of uh, Centrality and Peace, Zhonghe Tang, is located on top of Mount Phoenix, uh, Feng Huang, uh, Feng Huang Shan. Mm -hmm. And it's probably very difficult to see, but here it says, this is a modern map of uh, Hangzhou. Here's Feng Huang Shan, and here's the Wu Shan Guangchang, the square. Uh, next to Wu Mountain. They're really in the same place. They're sort of two peaks of the same same range. And they're in this... Uh, the map is oriented north to the right, south to the left, west up, east down. Uh, so it's in the southeast corner of the lake. Um, and here is actually a map <coughs> taken from the CLZ, yes, the Chun Yu Lianan Zhi, with the same picture, roughly the same picture of West Lake. Here is Feng Guangshan, Phoenix Mountain. Um, that is also where, I'll talk about this in a second, the, uh, uh, the uh, palace, Imperial Palace, was had its back to that mountain. And it's kind of nice here, you can see the city wall. Uh, you can see the city wall uh, with a palace at the back of it. This is West Lake. Uh, this was kind of the uh, mundane uh, political world. The other side of the lake, as you may know, has a lot of Buddhist temples. It was sort of the super mundane. Uh, sort of the uh, uh, release from worldly affairs on the other side of the lake, outside of the city walls. <clears throat> okay, so I think we can start to take a look at um, some text, and I just want to give you an overview of the text that we're going to look at to see what view of Hangzhou was contained, or Linan, was contained within these two gazetteers. Uh, uh, these two views being embodied in the literary descriptions of two different halls. <clears throat> So we're going to look at, in just a minute, um, two, really two works, literary works that these gazetteers cite to describe uh, the Yomei Tang Hall of Beauty. Um, that is a poem by Emperor Renzong, a uh, very famous poem, really a famous couplet from a poem by Emperor Renzong, uh, Emperor of the Northern Song. And then a very famous prose work, <coughs> the record of, hall, of the Hall of Possessing Beauty uh, by Ouyang Xiu. For the Hall of Centrality of Peace, so we'll look at two works. Um, we're going to look at a poem by the first emperor of the Southern Song, Emperor Kaozong, a poem he wrote uh, about Zhonghe Tang uh, to, and it was a poem bequeathed to one of his generals, uh, Zhang Jun, uh, who helped him put down an army insurrection, his own army uh, led an insurrection in Hangzhou against him. This general, Zhang Jun, put it down, and in some sense to thank him, I think, uh, he wrote this poem about uh, the Hall of Centrality and Peace. Okay. Um, so, we have uh, one view of Hangzhou uh, that is um, presented in literary works in these gazetteers, quoted in these gazetteers about the Hall possessing beauty. And I'll give you sort of the, uh, the conclusion first. The conclusion first. The literary works that depict this hall uh, depict it as an architectural marker of Hangzhou's rise to a new level of cultural and economic prominence in the 11th century of the Northern Song Dynasty. So its emphasis, this hall represents a kind of economic and cultural rise uh, at an earlier point in history, the 11th century. Uh, and sort of through the eyes of the Southern Song editor, it's written about very nostalgically, very nostalgically. So even before we get to the literary works, we have a little comment uh, from the uh, editor uh, about what he's, what he's uh, going to talk about. So here's how he describes, the editor describes uh, the Hall of Possessing Beauty. 
Note that at the site of the Hall of Possessing Beauty, the Qian family originally constructed the river and lake pavilion here. It must have been at the highest point of Wu Mountain, with a river to the left. Okay, it's true. Uh, the, li the, the river is to the left, the lake to the right, <clears throat> and therefore it became a famous location for ascending and gazing afar. Previous worthies wrote poems on it, such as the person I researched, uh, Su Dong Po, mm -hmm. uh, said in a poem that he could see banquet gatherings in the hall from a boat. This must have been a boat on West Lake. Old map guides, so these are Tu Jing, uh, state that the hall was located in the <coughs> prefectural city. Again, we, we can see that the old city boundary stopped at Wu Mountain, and it does. In 1246, the Metropolitan Prefect, this is the editor, Zhao Yuchou, obtained a small inscribed stele on the mountain peak to the side of the Tai Sui Palace. It was none other than the poem Emperor Renzong wrote and bestowed on Mr. May, uh, Northern Song official. From this, the hall's ancient foundations are revealed in greater detail. I just want to make two comments on this before we look at other literary works. <clears throat> but I think two important things about uh, this, this comment by the editor of the Gazetteer are, uh, he talks about, not they, they talk very little about architectural detail, mm -hmm. how this building was built, what it looks like, and much, much more about what can be seen from it. Uh, and so there's a poetic trope uh, in Chinese poetry dating back to at least the Six Dynasties, uh, or even the Eastern Han, uh, of Deng Gao Wang Yuan, uh, to uh, ascend a height and gaze afar, which a poet ascends a height and then falls into a historical reverie, in which the physical distance of one's gaze is equated with the temporal distance to which the poet poet's mind wanders. So looking afar is sort of like your mind wandering into the past. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one thing he associates this hall with. Another one is, I think, this archaeological discovery of the stele, right? The hall was not there anymore. We don't know what happened to it, uh, but it was no longer extant in the southern Song. So it goes up the mountain, he finds the stele, and he's delighted. It's got Emperor Renzong's poem on it. Which poem? This poem. Uh, but um, it's, it's very nostalgic, I think, uh, that he, he, he can't really recover the hall, but he has this stele. And he, it makes him think about what the hall meant back in the northern Song. So he uses the poetic trope of ascending a height, gaze afar, and he also uh, intersects a, uh, also a kind of nostalgic longing for a particularly glorious moment in the city's history. <clears throat> so, uh, back in the Northern Song Dynasty, Emperor Renzong uh, wrote uh, a Lu uh, Shi, a regulated verse, um, on uh, sort of commemorating the city and also his appointment of a high, uh, sort of high level uh, scholar official. Uh, major uh, to to that city as as the um, as the prefect of the city. Really, what's been remembered best are the are the is the first couplet, and the rest of the poem has not been uh, necessarily uh, as well remembered. <clears throat> but it is uh, in Mandarin. Di yo hu shan mei, dong nan di jiu. On earth, of all places possessing beautiful lakes and mountains, this ranks as the top prefecture in the southeast. And uh, you can see how this couplet was essentially turned into the name of the hall. Uh, so possessing the hall of possessing beauty. It's a rewriting of this uh, first couplet of his poem. So it's imperial recognition of the hall. And then after that, uh, this uh, official major requested uh, one of the most preeminent scholars of the day, uh, a great political reformer, uh, prose writer, and poet, Ouyang Xiu, to write a record of the hall. So Renzong wrote the poem, and then to sort of promote Hangzhou once again, uh, this official asked, please, Ouyang Xiu, can you write a record for me uh, to kind of commemorate uh, this great imperial recognition of the city? Um, so I'd like to kind of walk us through a couple of passages in Ouyang Xiu's preface. Again, I think the point of all these works about this hall is that the city represents a new economic and cultural rise uh, in the 11th century. And that's been, that's been verified by, by other um, uh, Chinese scholars, uh, Zhou Fang, uh, Xu Jijun, and, and others. <coughs> so I'm going to uh, read, this uh, is a kind of complex uh, prose work, but I'm going to sort of try to uh, focus on two discourses that uh, this prose work emphasizes about the city of Hangzhou. <coughs> One is a link uh, between landscape beauty and economic development. He kind of s 
starts off uh, with this premise that some places are positioned to have landscape beauty, but generally they're very can <coughs> they're very out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, other places are positioned to have economic development, right? Uh, but they're not, they don't have natural beauty because they're at the commercial crossroads, and so maybe the beauty is destroyed or maybe it's not there in the first place. Um, so, but he says only one place has both. <laughs> first of all, he says no place can have both. And then he says, oh, no, actually there is. Oh, two places, two places. Uh, one of those is Hangzhou. Uh, and so what he, uh, he says, very interesting argument, thus in terms of what a place possesses, it's Paul possessing beauty, uh, what it gains in this, it inevitably loses in that. Only with the so-called hall of possessing beauty is it possible to encompass the beauty of ascending a height, once again, to view water and mountains, and the prosperity of population and dwellings within a single gaze. Qian Tang, another word for Hangzhou, another uh, name for Hangzhou, combines all the beauties, it's Jian Mei, Jian Mei, all the beauties to, found, to be found beneath heaven, and this hall also possesses all the beauties of Qian Tang. Fitting indeed that you, you honor, uh, your honor should feel such affection for this unforgettable place. Mr. Mei is a gentleman who is pure, circumspect, and devoted to learning. By observing what he loves, we can know what kind of person he is. Right? So on the one hand, uh, according to Ouyang Xiu's record of the Hall of Possessing Beauty, uh, Hangzhou has a unique capacity to be placed both for landscape beauty and economic development. And this kind of continues to the current day, actually, a great deal. <clears throat> OK. Um, another thing he emphasizes about Hangzhou is its relation to the central government. Right? The Northern Song emerged from a period of, uh, of political division. Uh, and the, of course, the founder emperor uh, unified the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom of Wu, 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 Yue. Wu Yue was one of the last kingdoms uh, to, to be reconquered, um, but it went along essentially peacefully, uh, and hence uh, its sort of infrastructures, its cities uh, were not destroyed, were not damaged. And he emphasizes this as well. Only Tian Tang, since the time of the Five Dynasties, knew best to respect the central kingdoms, devoting themselves to ministers of the state peacefully. When it came time for the end of this Wuya kingdom, they bowed their heads and received their orders without need to bother with sword and spear. Today, the people's material needs are sufficient and they take delight in peace. Maybe we'll skip down a little bit. Um, Encircling the lakes are mountains. To the left and right, they reflect back on one another with merchants from Min and ocean going traders, their sails in the wind and boats on the waves, entering and departing by way of the broad and boundless river lost amidst the deep mists and clouds, truly it can be said to be flourishing. Uh, and those who come to this land must be grand ministers, great officials, and servitors of the emperor. And then there are the traveling scholars from the four corners of the empire who come as their guests at banquets. For this reason, they enjoy occupying the most scenic sites, constructing pavilions and kiosks where they can together exhaust the pleasure of touring and sightseeing. Let me stay there for a minute. So in the second passage, um, Ouyang Shou views Hangzhou's urban growth and flourishing economic trade in the 11th century as a direct outcome of its avoidance of a costly war with the Song armies and its benefiting from the latter's implementation of a centralized bureaucracy with which, uh, as a, with, with which Ouyang Shou closely identifies. So rather than Song, we can think of a very well organized, centralized bureaucracy. This city attracts merchants and traders, okay? and it also has something of a, uh, what we can now today's call an entertainment and tourism industry. Um, scholars of four directions become the guests at banquets. Uh, they occupy sort of the greatest heights for touring and sightseeing. Hangzhou's entertainment industry, including quarters and banquets, so which song works were written and performed, uh, was an institutionalized part of the life of a traveling official in the Northern Song centralized bureaucracy. <coughs> to sum up what the Hall of Possess and Beauty says about Hangzhou, uh, or what the gazetteer editors are trying to say through this literary work, uh, we can say really three things. Uh, that it combined the beauty of natural landscapes with urban economic prosperity, uh, that it became integrated into a centralized bureaucracy sooner and faster than other places did, um, and that it's efficiently parlayed the beauty of its natural landscapes into an entertainment and touring industry that is closely intertwined with elite socialization that accompanied the frequent rotation of officials from post to post in the new centralized bureaucracy. So if these were traveling officials, become Hangzhou, uh, uh, great entertainment. Um, 
So let's kind of keep this in mind that the Yomei Tang really represents the cultural and economic rise of Hangzhou in the 11th century, viewed rather nostalgically from the Southern Song editor's perspective. Okay, for another view within the same gazetteer, sitting side by side, literally on the same page, we have um, the Hall of Centrality and Peace. Uh, this is a poem uh, written by Emperor Gaozong uh, about this uh, hall. Um, see, and uh, I'm going to uh, read it and make a few uh, points about it. This is sort of has to be taken in the context of the uh, loss of the north at the beginning of the Southern Song. So it says, The six dragons wound round the river Huai in the sea. The 10,000 riders approached the fort of Wu. To be a king from the beginning is nothing but this. Tell them, revive the distant people. Looking afar at those grasslands and trees so fine, I feel these destructive wounds anew. Ascending the hall, I gaze. So once again, we have the trope of ascending a height to look afar. Ascending the hall, I gaze at Mount we can pronounce this a couple of different ways, but Kuai uh, Ji, cherishing ah uh, the labors uh, uh, of you of Xia. Miraculous, his accomplishments, mighty and great too, later generations are indebted to his benevolence. I wish to follow uh, Go Jian of Yue, putting these burning thoughts before myself. In this time of difficulty, I labor to shore up our strength, sage and worthies know when to withdraw and advance. Uh, their lofty airs move the sovereign, entrusting his aims to the minister, uh, Zhongli. Zhongli. Okay. Uh, let me um, make a few uh, main points about how this poem by Emperor Gaozong uh, views the city of Hangzhou. There are some allusions, a few allusions embedded in this poem, uh, but I'm going to make the main points first. Um, I think in this poem we can see uh, Hangzhou presented in uh, three ways, three important ways. One, it's presented as a refuge mm -hmm. uh, during a time when the court uh, was was in flight, uh, in flight uh, from uh, the invader, the church and invaders. Uh, so he talks about the six dragons wound around the river Huai in the sea, the 10,000 riders approach the fort of Wu. So he's fleeing across the Huai River. He ends up in Wu, the area where the region where Hangzhou is. Uh, it is a it is a refuge. Uh, another thing we can see is that uh, Gao Zong declares an oath to, in effect, liberate uh, the peoples in the occupied north. Uh, so he says to be a king from the beginning is nothing but this. Tell them, revive the distant people. Uh, looking afar at those, this means the north, grasslands and trees so fine, I feel these destructive wounds anew. Using a word, destructive wounds, that could refer to uh, bodily wounds uh, or here in this kind of territorial uh, wounds. Um, he also, uh, the last point I think, closely associates, uh, he's gazing at Mount Kuai Ji. This is a city of uh, Shaoxing. Uh, Shaoxing was a uh, temporary capital before Hangzhou, uh, and it, it was uh, renamed in the early Southern Song to essentially uh, mean continuing the imperial throne and leading the restoration. By gazing at the city, he's emphasizing uh, kind of a uh, agenda to uh, restore the lost territories. He also associates himself with a couple of uh, important historical figures. The ancient ruler Yu, uh, the Xia Dynasty, uh, allegedly the Xia Dynasty, uh, he is known for his flood control measures, so restoring order. Uh, the king of Yue, uh, Gou Jian, uh, who was once captured by the king of Wu, spent 10 years sort of plotting his uh, revenge uh, to retake his kingdom. Uh, and with his minister, uh, Zhong Li, uh, eventually over 10 years did so. So he's associating himself with these historical figures. Um, nowhere in the Gazetteers does it tell uh, to whom this poem was written. It simply includes this poem. We have other historical records that do indicate, sorry, uh, a scholar uh, named Li, Li Xin, Xin Chuan, right, uh, important historian of the period, records of important affairs since the beginning of the Jian Yan era. Uh, he notes that this was actually a poem bequeathed to a general named Zhang Jun, Zhang Jun, who helped put down a, um, uh, a an insurrection, a military insurrection uh, in Hangzhou. In Hangzhou. 
So, um, for time considerations, I want to move on. Uh, but clearly, in this poem on the Hall of Centrality and Peace, uh, we have Hangzhou uh, not associated with an economic rise, uh, cultural and economic rise in the 11th century, uh, but really with irredentist ambitions. Um, and it also closely connects the city of Hangzhou with the city of Shaoxing uh, and gazing to the north. So we have these two views of Hangzhou sitting side by side in this gazetteer. And I want to look at one more set of texts. Let's see how we do that. Um, as, so we have these two views of, uh, as the economic and cultural rise as, uh, associated with the loss of the North and the irredentist ambitions. How do we understand what the views of the editor are? We have some framing devices within this uh, gazetteer that I think will help us understand maybe which view was predominant. Uh, and I'll see if I have time to talk about both. Uh, I want to talk about at least uh, one of these. Um, let me see. Uh, there are two chapters uh, that are preserved. As I mentioned earlier, these two gazetteers are, are, are fragmentary. There are two chapters that are preserved in full uh, in both uh, gazetteers, QLZ and CLZ. Uh, this is uh, the chapter on the greater prefectural seat, the Changfu, so about the city itself, and a chapter on the mountains and rivers. In both of these, we can see Hangzhou being geographically graded on a scale vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, territories, either ancient territories or, or contemporary territories in the north. Uh, so one of the functions of gazetteers apparently is to sort of grade and rank, grade and rank, uh, different types of landscapes. So I'm going to look at a passage from each of these and uh, we'll let you know what uh, they emphasize. Um, I'm just going to read a portion of, of this first one. But here is the opening essay from uh, the prefectural seat chapter. I'm just going to read a few sentences from the very beginning. <clears throat> Nowadays, shops line the city eve to eve, and it is the apex of the four directions. Okay, that's what you might expect. Of a capital, it's the apex of the four directions. Lofty and dazzling, it cannot be exceeded. Yet I have also heard of the capital at Chang'an with its eight lanes and nine avenues together forming the warp and weft and the imperial avenue, none of which, uh, upon which none but the emperor could travel running down the middle. To the left and to the right of the imperial avenue, the land rose and fell, showing a distinction between high and low. From this, one knew the might and splendor that inspires reverence for the capital's authority and understood the signs, the signs of a capital city, the Jingzhao, uh, which makes it the head of all provinces. <coughs> There's a couple of allusions I'm just going to skip uh, and jump to the last couple of sentences. Uh, however, heaven creates and earth establishes. The conditions necessary to raise the great and flourishing capital are not the accumulation of a single decade or century. Such things as this do not change. Therefore, I have fully discussed this here. So, he starts off saying that there's great commercial prosperity still in the city of Hangzhou, and then makes comparison uh, to another city. Uh, and this is the city of Chang'an. Chang'an was the capital of uh, the Chinese Empire for the Han and Tang dynasties. Uh, it uh, is in the north. Anyone know where uh, the sort of site of uh, Chang'an is located in roughly modern China? Xi'an. Xi'an. Yes, very good. Excellent. Uh, so Xi'an, uh, you know, we're talking about the, the north and slightly to the west, uh, Shanxi, uh, yes, Shanxi province. <coughs> uh, according to scholars' research, Chang'an was really defined by its chessboard grid of streets, so extremely orderly, the Imperial Avenue that went down the center, and another distinguishing feature of it was, and many actually northern imperial capitals, uh, is the orientation of the Imperial Palace facing the south. It was thought the emperor faces south, it says this in the Analects, uh, it's like the uh, pole star. All the other stars will just naturally rotate around it. Order will be maintained if there's certain geographic alignment, in a sense. Um, <clears throat> here's a quick jump back to what the Hangzhou uh, capital looked like. Its back is facing the south, and the emperor is facing north. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is not the correct uh, <laughs> geographic alignment. If we jump to another picture, ah, uh, this is a little bit of a close-up on the Imperial City. Again, um, the left is south, the right is north. Uh, so this is the back of the palace, 
here is the Imperial Avenue, uh, it's facing north. So in this uh, chapter on Chengfu, Hangzhou is being measured by a canonical standard of Chang'an, and it's fallen short. It's fallen short by far. Uh, and it doesn't have the jingzhao, the signs of a capital. And this is a source of anxiety. Okay. Um, another very interesting passage, uh, not on the city so much, but the surrounding mountains and rivers. So this uh, chapter is called the Mountains and Rivers chapter, appropriately enough. Still, here again, the regional landscape of Wu is being measured against landscapes of the north. And uh, so he describes the landscape of the Wu and Yue region. Wu would be Hangzhou, Yue would be Shaoxing, or also known as Kuai Qi. <coughs> and here's what they, the editor state in this section. Mount Phoenix rears its head and then lays out its tail, as though soaring up then drawing together. Its front border extends all the way to the Great River, here meaning the Qian Tang River. Mm -hmm. uh, and only then does it stop. Truly, it is unusual, yet at the same time not unusual. Once, I took an inspection <coughs> tour, starting from the mountains of Yi and She counties, both in modern-day Anhui, uh, modern uh, Guasang, and Mount uh, Tiantai, both rise tall and steep. Arriving at the Wuzhou Mountains, I then descended the peaks of Mount Tu and Sheng, okay, all in Zhejiang province, where the mountains gradually level off. <coughs> uh, the sparse Yunmen Hills and Kuai Qi are moistened by Mirror Lake, and only there does the land flatten out and become easy going. The Wen Peaks are fine and slowly extend to ceiling. These are the mount so-called mountains of the King of Yue. They lead all the other mountains on its flanks, rising up and reaching the border at the river, uh, where it too stops. The paired mountains of Wu and Yue in this way are like the host and the guest of the Zhe River, threading them together horizontally. I know there was a lot of geographic detail there, but in short, <clears throat> um, he's linking Hangzhou to Shaoxing, uh, and he's linking Wu and Yue together. Uh, Hangzhou is the host, uh, Shaoxing is the guest. This was a main capital and kind of a supporting capital relationship. The contrast and here, just uh, for fun uh, and interest, is a, uh, another depiction from this gazetteer again of the city of Hangzhou in relation to the Zhe River. This Zhe River links Hangzhou and Shaoxing uh, together. Shaoxing is more to the northeast. Um, so again, this kind of idea of linking those two cities together is represented within the text itself, pictorially, visually. But he wasn't done yet. Uh, there's one more passage I want to talk about here before uh, heading towards some conclusions. Um, OK, so these two cities are connected. Shaoxing is kind of a reminder to retake the north. Um, it is north, located slightly north, but still within southern Song territory. But he goes on. This is not the end of it. Uh, all of a sudden, an unnamed interlocutor uh, kind of bursts in. So we have this lyrical description of the landscape of the southeast. And he says, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold, you know, hold, hold your horses, stop the show. Uh, this, this is, there's something wrong here. And this is what the interlocutor says. Thereupon, someone sighed an alarm, <sighs> yes, sign alarm, stating, mountains and rivers are without feeling. Rather, they are the result of heaven's craft. Mm -hmm. okay, bear with me. Heaven cannot possess craft. Rather, they are the place where qi uh, gathers. Hence, in those places where qi, give a definition in a second, gathers, there is no such thing as heaven understanding craft or mountains and rivers understanding feeling. Over there okay, are such powerful formations as Taihang Mountain, mm -hmm. the Yellow River, Song Mountain, the Luo River, Yong Mountain, and the Wei River. One can sit and imagine them all. As for the mountains and rivers of Hangzhou, their beauties are numerous indeed, but in the larger comparison, they should be viewed from this perspective. So. Uh, those are a lot of geographic names, but it's safe to say the Yellow River, the Wei River, these are all things that were in the occupied north. Uh, viewed from this compa comparison, the, the landscape of Hangzhou is beautiful indeed, uh, but in terms of ranking or grading uh, different types of landscapes, he puts the editors put priority on those of the north. So I just want to make a few, couple of observations about this passage and then move on to um, some Okay, uh, so <clears throat> the interlocutor seems shocked that some may have forgotten those B is a term he uses, mighty mountains and rivers of the north that are listed in alternating order. 
mountain and river. Implicitly comparison to these, si, mountains and rivers in the southeast, where the gazetteers and contemporary readers presumably resided. Uh, he has this really interesting discourse about uh, mountain rivers uh, have no feeling, heaven has no craft, and landscape is the place where qi gathers. So what does this mean? Well, I'll give a couple of uh, possibilities. <clears throat> On the one hand, uh, the interlocutor seems to be arguing that it is humans who have the ability to invest feelings in landscape and the craft to shape them, not having, uh, not the landscapes themselves. The way that humans can invest emotion in landscape, even those that are physically inaccessible to them, such as the landscapes of the north, were to the CLZ's readership, is to sit and imagine them, uses xia, or to take an imagined journey, shenyu, to those places. On the other hand, uh, the interlocutor also views landscapes as the accumulation of qi, or as one scholar, Hoyt Tillman, has translated the term environmental energy. Uh, at the end of the introductory essay to the Mountains and Rivers chapter, the interlocutor ranks the environmental energy, qi, of landscapes in the north above those in the southeast in an implicit hierarchy, stating, uh, as for the mountains and rivers on Zhou, their beauties are diverse indeed, but in large comparison they should be viewed from this perspective. Um, there were other writers in the Southern Song who were making arguments that landscapes have qi, have environmental energy. One was a scholar official named as Chen Liang. He described the zheng qi uh, of the northern landscapes and the pian qi, uh, the sort of uh, correct qi of the north and the sort of uh, peripheral qi uh, of the south. Something I would like to explore in greater detail later on is to what extent qi was a part of landscape discourse. That in fact you could sort of say different landscapes have different, like people. You know, your qi might be good and your healthy, your qi might be bad and you're unhealthy, uh, where they're sort of environmental or landscape qi. But that's kind of a, a topic for another day. Um, here I'd like to talk about how these gazetteers uh, present Hangzhou. So let me uh, move to the conclusions. Needless to say, I think these framing devices uh, tend to be in line uh, with the discussion of Hangzhou in the section on the Hall of Centrality and Peace. That is, it associates it with territorial loss and an irredentist agenda. But that seems to be where the voice of the editors comes out most clearly, is in these framing devices. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, here are my conclusions. Um, first and foremost, First of all, uh, this has been an attempt to sort of try to interpret uh, local gazetteers of the Southern Song. How do we read these darn things, right? Um, uh, they're not always so reader friendly. But I think we can at least <clears throat> make three uh, sort of conclusions about how we can productively uh, read and interpret gazetteers. And one is, uh, it's interesting to see the extent to which place in its accumulated history shape and circumscribe geographic meaning in the local gazetteers. And in this particular example, I've looked at two gazetteers that are separated by 80 years, and yet they cite the exact same text uh, to describe these two halls. And so the discourse seems actually pretty, at least in this case, pretty consistent across time. Uh, the accumulated history seems to really circumscribe how, how these places are talked about. Certain key events, like imperial recognition. <clears throat> uh, second, a series of local gazetteers on the same administrative unit that are linked together as sequels, which I think we can say QLZ, CLZ, R, uh, tend to layer quotations of literary texts, adding new texts to the list of their predecessors, or inserting new framing devices for a set of texts. So I've tried to show QLZ and CLZ use the same literary, quote the same literary text. QL, uh, CLZ, the later one, introduces some framing devices to make sort of the position of the editors, I think, even more explicit. <clears throat> Third, most importantly, uh, the Gazetteer was not merely compendi a compendium of neutral geographic data, but rather had become an important vehicle for making geopolitical arguments aimed at a contemporary audience of court and literati elite. And this is different from the preceding map guides or Puqing, which were largely for administrative purpose uh, and not really <clears throat> so didactic or moralistic. Um, to summarize what we've seen, uh, in the Hall of Possessing Beauty, description of the literary text quoted there, <clears throat> we can see the hall represents the cultural and uh, uh, economic rise of Hangzhou in the 11th century, and it's the attitude of the editors is of pride and nostalgia. Uh, it reflects the priorities of the highly cosmopolitan and mobile Northern Song literati, <coughs> centralized administration, harnessing of local and natural economic resources within a larger national framework, delight in the burgeoning entertainment industry in the city, such as uh, welcoming and partying, <coughs> courtesan banquets, 
that have become an emblem of cultivated literati uh, elite identity. The Hobbes centrality in peace, the lyric text quoted there, we can see uh, the view of Hangzhou uh, promoted in that account reflects the anxieties and irredentist ambitions of, in 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, Gao Zong's poem linked the Hall to the loss of the North and the flight south. This poem also linked Hangzhou to Shaoxing, evoking the memory of the court's early resettlement in the South, as well as a set of historically foundational uh, or martial figures like Yu the Great, who tamed the flood, or Gou Jian, uh, who over 10 years uh, got the plan together to recover his kingdom, just like perhaps Gao Zong would like to position himself. Uh, you know, whether he was sincere or not, we don't know, but um, that's what he said. <coughs> Uh, last conclusion. Um, let me see. I think I'm actually just going to jump to the very, very bottom. Um, <coughs> sort of uh, final conclusion, and, and, and where I'd like to take this next, maybe in the future, um, is we've seen that for the editors of QLZ and CLZ, gazetteers were not compendium of neutral geographic data meant for administrative purposes. That uh, should be alone. Um, these were often joint ventures between private scholars and officials. So there may have been some administrative. Uh, purpose, but they seem to have a very moral and didactic bent uh, uh, agenda. Uh, rather, gazetteers were, so coming back to the idea of qi, or environmental energy, maybe we can say, or hypothesize, that regardless of what different uh, gazetteers' agendas were, and there could be as many agendas as there were gazetteers, they might actually have a very local focus rather than a focus on recovering uh, the north. Um, but regardless of agenda, <coughs> We could say that maybe it was a, gen a genre for grading and characterizing the environmental energy of a place in order to rank it appropriately in proposing different solutions to the reconstitution of the empire as a whole. Thank you very much. Good look at the picture. <coughs> I kind of like it. I like it. That one. Now we have uh, comments and questions. Yes, Professor. Could you say just a bit about the third gazetteer? Is it more complete? What did it come from? Uh, the last gazetteer, I believe, was compiled in uh, 1268. So as we can see up here, uh, this second one was in 1250. Um, that's mighty close to the <coughs> end of the Southern Song. And it is by far the longest and most complete. Um, meaning it has the least loss of jian, of chapters, uh, and it is much longer uh, than either of them. They, they get increasingly longer over time. The first two were separated by 80 years, and the second and third one are only separated by about 18. Um, I think the, the head compiler uh, you know, lived into the, the, the Yuan Dynasty, um, so it was really that close to the Mongol invasion of the Southern Song. Um, it adds yet more text, and so it, it adds another layer of complexity that I thought might be more than I <laughs> tackle in this talk. There's actually, in the Zhong He Tang uh, section, there's a Zhong He Tang Ji, a record of the Zhong He Tang by a late Southern Song official who I've yet to track down and find out who he is. So that's, that. I, I think in a, in a more, um, you know, perhaps in a book manuscript version, if there was a chapter on gazetteers and what they have to say about Hangzhou, of course, I would incorporate material on the, on the third one. Um, but as of yet, I have yet to explore that in depth. But it's interesting that it's um, so close, uh, you know, in terms of time, written after the second one. Um, <clears throat> I, it would be very interesting to see what that Zhong He Tang Ji has to say, and if it's, if it's also about aerodentist ambitions, or if it's got a totally different angle on it. Could, it, could, it could well be very different indeed. Is that third one uh, Chen Yue Yong's Chen Chen Yes, oh. yes, that's, that is the third one. The third one. Uh, and it's longer and more complicated. <coughs> but also more complete. So maybe more representative of what a gazetteer would look like by the end of the, by the, end of the dynasty. Yes? Um, you spoke of qi, or environmental energy. Could you contrast that to Feng Shui? <laughs> yeah, those are a lot of, that's a fascinating question. And um, uh, gosh, um, qi, I don't know. I would say this, I think just, just in general terms, uh, qi is kind of a concept that 
many discourses use. You know, discourse maybe is a more organized uh, system of, uh, <coughs> of thought or, or ideas. Uh, and, and chi is just one concept. So medical discourse mm -hmm. uh, uses chi. Uh, you may know traditional Chinese medicine. Many of you probably can speak more <laughs> better to this than I can. Uh, evidently, uh, in terms of landscape, uh, it's also a concept. Feng Shui is, is one discourse about landscape. So I, I don't think, I wouldn't say they're, they're two different things, but that Qi is an idea. This, in a way, probably is a kind of Feng Shui, um, a landscape, uh, geomancy, uh, proper geograph geographic alignment. So to answer your question, I think Qi is probably a part of Feng Shui uh, discourse. A discourse on proper positioning, alignment, uh, geomancy, sort of that, that proper alignment will bring good auspicious things, um, but it also belongs to medical discourses. Uh, it belongs to Neo-Confucian. Uh, these Neo-Confucian philosophers uh, had Li and Qi, a sort of principle and Qi, bodily Qi. Anyway, I think <clears throat> it's part of it, rather than being something separate from it, but it was also in a lot of other um, discourses at the time. I'd be really interested to trace specifically how it was used to talk about landscape at the time. I know that there was at least one other writer that was roughly contemporary with this gazetteer named Chan Yang. Um, he was from the southeast, uh, and yet he had this political sort of idea that there's a zheng qi, a proper qi in the north, a pian qi, a peripheral qi in the southeast. Uh, we really need to grab hold of the proper qi uh, in order to sustain the empire over a long period of time. Um, so other people were using it uh, in a way that seems sort of close to the editors of the Gazetteer. I wonder, were there more people? And did they have other ways of talking about landscape and qi? <clears throat> it's a challenging concept. Um, but pin down. Yes? Uh, can you relate this also to the use of the cardinal directions, the alignment to the north, south, east, west? Yeah, well, one thing that was remarked on, uh, and I, I touched upon this as, as moving through the talk kind of quickly, um, is the idea that uh, the imperial palace within a capital city, um, kind of a canonical norm was to have it face the south. Uh, and so, simply because I think it wasn't really practical um, to do so in Hangzhou, it was facing north. Um, I think they put the imperial palace with its back to Fenghuangshan because it was the most strategically, uh, it was strategically the best place to put it. There's a mountain at the back, and then on the other side is the Tiantang River, so it's very well defended in that position. But it broke kind of um, directional placement rules um, that were very ancient indeed, uh, that go back to the Han and Tang capital of Chang'an. Uh, so I don't, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but I mean, do we have sort of a sense of in the US where things are supposed to face? Um, hmm, I can't think of a good analogy, but uh, yes, it was important. Um, that was considered inauspicious, and to have not be meeting the signs of the capital, the Jing Zhang, that you have, that apparently they had a turn for the proper signs of the capital. Yeah, thank you, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, so a number of questions about the circulation and the audience, and then also some question about the maps, where do they appear within the Gazetteer, um, and maybe even are they typically found in Southern Song Gazetteers. Maybe, I think the second question is a little more, scope is a little, I, I, I can maybe address that first. Um, yes, they, they were included, uh, certainly in the modern edition, editions, modern editions that well, really unpunctuated. They're, 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 they reflect the Southern Song printed editions. They're usually in the front, usually at the beginning, the first few pages, uh, and not in, and not not like the PPT here, interspersed sort of at, at a convenient moment to illustrate a point. 
Uh, nope, they're all on the front. And for the ones that I've looked at, and really I've looked at gazetteers for Lin'an, for Hangzhou, and also for um, uh, oh, Tian Kang, which is modern day <coughs> Nanjing. Yes, they seem to be pretty consistent. They have many, I don't know if all, but many have maps. And they're usually placed at the beginning. Um, in terms of uh, where they printed, and how broadly did they circulate, and then what the, re what the intended readership is, well, yes, they were printed. Um, I, I would have to uh, look in more to you know, the nature of just how broadly circulated they were, but I would presume they were, were, were fairly broadly circulated. Um, you have, at least in the case of Jian Kang and, and Lin An, um, you have sequels. And I think sequels is at least one indicator to the extent of uh, how, how, how widely read they were. Uh, it was important enough to do it even better that someone did a sequel at, in at least two cases that we know about. And then there's so much loss that it's hard to say. I can't think of any other sequels for the Southern Song. But um, I think based on the fact that there are sequels, that, that implies that somebody took the trouble to, it was important enough to do a better one every once in a while for the region. Um, I, and I think in terms of audience, we can say that kind of following Ruth Mostern and James Hargett, that largely these were intended for a scholar or official elite audience. Not necessarily uh, for um, government, like central government purposes. And I say not necessarily uh, because oftentimes co-sponsors or co-editors were scholar officials who felt kind of um, some importance to the region to, to, to carry it out and maybe help fund it. Um, but in some ways, more private than public. Certainly when you compare it to uh, Tu Jing, which were largely purely administrative use. <clears throat> Those are great questions, and I think especially in terms of the print circulation, style widely, how many editions, uh, that, that's something I would, I would look into in more, in more detail. But I hope I've at least partially addressed your, your question. Yes. I have one <coughs> comment and a question. Uh, I will just make the comment if I have time, and I'll raise the question. Um, it's a comment on a very minor de de detail. Please, those are the most minor, important. Minor, yet very important. Uh, in the beginning, you translated the uh, name of the capital, uh, as known in the Southern Song, Vietnam, as temporary peace. That's incorrect. Mm, thank you. I made that mistake decades ago when I was writing my dissertation, was corrected by, by my teacher. Frederick Maltz. Yes. <laughs> he, in his comment on my on that little mistake in my draft, uh, said I myself published a book and translated that name Lin An as temporary peace. I was corrected by my teacher, <laughs> Yang Lianshan. <laughs> so I will pass that uh, Please do. <laughs> correction on <laughs> several generations back. Uh, Anyway, Lin An should mean something like approaching peace. Mm. And you have actually in uh, the poem by Gao Zhong, mm -hmm. uh, Gao Zhong, the second line, Wan Ji Lin, Wu Jin. You see that character, same character there? Mm. You mm -hmm. correctly yes. translated it. <laughs> yes, approaching. Okay. Right? Okay, yes. Yep. Yeah. Lin, Lin and then you, you have the uh, song title, Lin Jiang Xian. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Which, nobody has translated it as the temporary river, river, <laughs> river, god. river god, right? Okay. And this is important because uh, it took Emperor Gao Zong a long time, the, you know, the um, sort of uh, fleeing Song court, a long time to finally settle true. in Hangzhou. They wouldn't name the capital only tempor temporary peace, right? Mm -hmm. So approaching peace, oh, and long last, we <coughs> have approached peace. Mm -hmm. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay. No, thank you very much. And, and <laughs> I will be able to tell the next generation. Why it if is you still <laughs> make, you should make the same mistake. Yes, I will let them know. From Frederick Merck to Professor Lin Chun Fu. No, <laughs> Yang Lianshang. Oh, Yang. I think probably a uh, oh, few Yang people Lian in this okay. room right. know Yang Lianshang. Mm. Uh, 
you know, professor uh, in Harvard, yes. uh, as a, a brilliant psychologist. Anyway, uh, let no other people make comments or ask questions. Change that right away. I think it makes more sense now. From Gal's own yeah. perspective, it wouldn't be a temporary piece, but maybe finally being a approaching piece, maybe in his mind it is more long term. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> As the southern sun collapsed, there was this discourse that Hangzhou was too pretty. Mm. <laughs> and it was one of the reasons for the collapse. Do you see any signs of that in these earlier ones? Well, um, a little bit. I think it seems um, kind of, uh, parts of it seem like the passages quoted to describe Yomei Tang, very nostalgic and kind of historical. Yeah. This is where, this is what Here's, here's Hangzhou uh, at its, or Qian Tang, at its height in the 11th century when it first um, superseded places like Suzhou um, uh, or Yangzhou that might have been considered top to, even top tier cities in the Tang, uh, but Hangzhou had sort of superseded them uh, in the Song. And so in that sense, I don't think there's any, it's actually, I, I feel like when, when the editor picks up that steely and says, wow, this has got Renzong's poem on it, there's no sense of shame or, or uh, uh, kind of disgust with you know, an overripe fruit of Hangzhou or something like that. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the uh, the um, Shan was a Shan Tuan or the the last section on <clears throat> mountains and rivers, uh, he does say that okay, beautiful is beautiful, Mei Li sure Mei Li, sure, Mayo it's not as important as. As, as recovering those territories in the north. So it seems kind of mo mo moderated. Uh, sometimes the purpose is to record a certain historical sta stage, other times there's a more powerful, say, rhetorical call for action or you know, dentist ambition. So I, I don't know, I wonder, I mean, perhaps <coughs> perhaps it was the, the Yuan conquest of, of Hangzhou or the entire continental Chinese Empire that led to a more um, sustained and intense uh, discourse about beauty as the cause of the disaster. I don't quite get that sense here. What would you expect? Just yeah. still curious. No, absolutely. That's a good point. And, and that it, it shifts again um, at the end. Perhaps there's like another, there's an 11th century stage of discourse, there's a 12th, 13th stage discourse, and then there's a post. <laughs> yes. um, did I hear that you're saying the palace is facing north? Correct. And yes. That, so is that a norm for other palaces in other capitals? No, I don't. You know, I think all the way up to that point, uh, the norm had been south, precisely uh, the opposite, <laughs> okay. uh, and so it broke a long-standing norm or tradition. And I don't know, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to guess that in other East Asian capitals, certainly Nara and uh, Kyoto, I, I'd be shocked, shocked if uh, the Imperial Palace was not facing south. Um, I mean, okay, I could, I, I don't know, I looked it up, but um, so <clears throat> that that norm, that, that model of Chang'an traveled and was translated to other regions, certainly to Heian and medieval Japan. Mm -hmm. I don't know about Tokyo. Tokyo can, could be another story. We can always say that President Nixon restored the importance of Hangzhou, right? Uh, uh, but by, by coming to China in 1971? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. He certainly realigned the uh, U.S. China relationship, no doubt about that. Yes. He was, he was pivotal in, in that regard. <laughs> no doubt about it. Well, nobody uh, has a question. I'll ask my question. Uh, you have not made any comments on the name of the second poem, Zhonghe. Yes. Even though you discussed Gao Zhong's poem, yes. uh, which is uh, very odd. I mean, Gao Zhong's poem is very odd. Uh, in the poem, he makes no reference to Zhonghe. Mm -hmm. Not only that, okay. to Zhonghe either. Right. Sorry, go ahead. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, because Zhonghe are two very important concepts mm -hmm. in the uh, ancient 
text one of the four books, Zhong Yong? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let me see. Uh, I can say two things. Just a, another piece of information that I didn't include in the talk. It's true, I am not sure, so I'll just say it flat out, I'm not sure what the precise textual origin of the name of that hall is. Yomei Tang, it was a little easier to track down. Uh, uh, Ouyang Shou's record pretty much spells out the whole story <laughs> where it comes from. Um, so that was that's relatively easy to resolve. Chung uh, Tang, in the Gazetteers, it does note that after, and I didn't mention this, uh, Gao Zong wrote his poem, they changed the name of the hall to Wei Guan Tang, kind of uh, mighty, or, Wei Guan, Wei Guan, uh -huh. sort of vast uh, vista, mm -hmm. um, sort of mighty vista hall, the hall of the mighty vista. Uh, so it was changed. Um, because of this poem? <laughs> it, it just, Batteries. yeah, it, it says it was, it was changed. Um, Does Gao Zhong's poem have a title? Which is explicitly Zhong He Tang, blah, blah, blah. It sh shows up in the Xuan Song Shi as, I think, Zhong uh, He Tang Shi. Hmm. But I didn't see any title in the gazetteers themselves. So I suspect that maybe the editors of Xuan Song Shi uh, pulled this out of, the, they, they say they pulled it out of the gazetteer. So that's, that and um, the Xin Chuan's history are the two locus classicus, or anyway, the sources that it actually comes from. I, I think they just made up the title to give it a title, uh, mm -hmm. later editors. So I don't know that I did have a title. I, I, so, I threw, all right, so I did a little data mining. I threw Zhong He Tang into Si Hu Quan Shu, see what pops up. Um, there, there were some, I think there might be other Zhong He Tang, uh, and there were some Neo-Confucian um, texts about uh, Zhong He Tang, but I, I am still uh, working on it, and I'm not clear if that's that one that Gao Zong wrote his poem on, or perhaps another one with the same, the same name. It's, 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 it's possible. So I acknowledge that those two terms have a very specific uh, meaning and resonance to Neo-Confucian philosophy. Um, I'm not sure if that's the reason why it was named that. Uh, and it seems like Gao Zong's, if, that's, if that was the reason, Gao Zong's poem doesn't seem to pick up on any of those, to me anyway, no. centrality and peace. Uh, it doesn't seem to pick up on really explicitly so, also, he, I mm -hmm. think, means harmony rather than peace. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, Hall of centrality, harmony would mm -hmm. be probably a better translation. No, thank you very much. Further research needed to that. Thank you.